Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. History 101, Episode 18. The Ancient Hebrews, Success and Trauma. So we start with early successes. Having uh, pushed into the lands of Cana, we will have David. They will clear out the Canaanite tribes, and then David, who starts out as a warlord, overthrows Saul, creates his kingdom around somewhere around 1050 to 1000 BCE, unites the tribes, defeats the Philistine enemy, there's your Goliath, allies with the Phoenicians, who are the merchants to the north, and then builds the most important thing up to this point for the early Hebrews, Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is a Mesopotamian city. It's built on the Mesopotamian model, and the reason why is they're Mesopotamian and they live in a Mesopotamian world. And remember, Babylon is out there. You want to be a significant people, you need to have a city, and it needs to be an impressive city. Now, no one's going to rebuild Babylon. I mean, the Assyrians will try, and so will the Persians. But the Hebrews are a small, poor, middle power. They're not going to have their own um, Babylon. But the fact that they build Jerusalem and make it into a capital city shows they are a serious people in Mesopotamia. They're to be taken seriously. There's lots of other people that we've talked about who don't have a major city. So the early Hebrews are having cleared out Cana, having put their stamp on this land, having created a king who has military power, then begins to build a city that will be in the order of Tyre, of the Phoenician cities, of later Damascus, of some of the Sumerian cities, to good middle-sized power city. So the Hebrews within David's, David's lifetime go from a tough hill people trying to establish themselves in Cana who have a religious chip on their shoulders because they're they got this super god that they are walking carrying the ark of the covenant with to a significant middle power now they're not egypt they're not babylon but they're not nobodies either and that's important they've gone from a nothing to a something in one man's lifetime solomon will build on that david's son solomon will build the most important building, the temple, the temple to Yahweh. It will be 30% of the area within Jerusalem. It will have the Holy of Holies. That's God's apartment on earth. It's where the Ark of the Covenant will rest. It will have thousands of priests who are doing the work, who are doing the education, who are doing the um, civic duties that are helping people and, and creating this economic engine. It is the significant building. It is the biggest significant building in the city. It is a center of education. It is the center of writing. It shows that religion is the most important aspect of this culture. Not war. Like the Assyrians. And not the Pharaoh. As is is the culture of the Middle Kingdom. Or the economy of the old kingdom. Religion. Yahweh. So the Hebrews are small. They're relatively poor. But they have an impressive cultural power. That's so within a hundred years, within two men's lifetimes, they have gone from a tough hill tribe living in the arid lands of, of Cana, trying to battle other Canaanite tribes, to toe-to-toe militarily with the Philistines, who are, remember, tough proto-Greek warrior Vikings on the coasts, right? Who always scare them because they're like badass barbarians, right? But they are the most impressive cultural power south kind of of, the well, definitely south of the Phoenicians, but there's an argument that may be made that there are more significant cultural power. Now, remember, the Phoenicians basically invent the alphabet, so that's something. 
Um, but between Babylon and and um, Egypt, you know, the Hebrews have, you know, can represent is the point. They can represent where they fit in, in terms of power, both militarily and culturally, they can represent. They're holding their own, which is impressive given the sizes of the empires right on their borders. So here's a little story. It's a little aside. I'd like to tell it because it's not told enough and um. It has, it's, it's just nice. And if, you know, there's a not, not enough stories that in this class that highlight, um, black women. And so this is a nice one that I can do. So I'd like to do it. A sign of success for the Hebrews is the queen of Sheba. Makeda shows up. This is in Solomon. Now. We don't exactly know where Sheba is. It could be Saba, which is in Yemen, in southern Arabia, or it could be Shiwa, which is in Eritrea, Ethiopia. Uh, both lands lay claim to Sheba, to the to be in the land of Sheba, but also the queen of Sheba. Josephus says it's Mero, which is up the Nile in Ethiopia. Right? We've talked about that when we talked about Egypt. And is very clear. Josephus is kind of the great Jewish Roman Latin historian um, of the of the destruction of the Second Temple of of around sixty A.D. of the post Jesus time period. Um, Josephus is the kind of the best historian source that we have of Palestine, what the Romans would have called Palestine in the kind of early Christian period. He says, he's very clear. She comes, he says he comes from what we would have called Mero, and but he is very clear. She is a queen, not a consort. She is Solomon's equal. Because there are some stories that are like, well, she's a girl and she's a this. And she, it, she, Josephus is like, she is a queen who is Solomon's equal. And she comes rolling in like Aladdin to go meet the princess. She comes rolling in with a thousand people, a circus and monkeys and elephants. And she comes rolling in because she is a queen and she is showing up. Um, we will see this one in part three when we do um, Mansa Musa's Hajj to, to, a, um, to Mecca which is essentially the same kind of parade as he goes through the world. He effectively changes the economy of the places he goes through. Like economically, you can actually see in history when Mansa Musa shows up and when his, his retinue leave, the prices just, it, it change. That's the queen of Shiva. So she arrives to question Solomon's wisdom and Hey, if possible, establish red sea trade. She shows up with a thousand or more people of retinue because queens do not travel alone. Um, she shows up with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Ooh, where have we heard that before? That's interesting. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those are kind of kingly gifts now, aren't they? And all of this showing up being, well, black and being awesome and being rich and having all of this stuff just blows away the Hebrews. Remember, the Hebrews aren't dealing with many other people. They're not a culture that's like the Phoenicians, out and about all over the place. They're trying to keep to themselves, lest they get absorbed by these other places. So these people show up from Africa or Yemen, these dark-skinned people show up, and it just blows their freaking minds. So she asked Solomon Riddles. She's like, I, I heard you were wise, so I'm going to ask you questions. And they make a trade treaty on the side, and everybody's happy. And then they hook up. And their lords and their ladies hook up. And their servants hook up. Why? Because they hang out for about for a year. And there's different stories and there's different amount of times, but it's always significant. And the idea is that um, they hang out. And well, she's a queen and he's a king and they're awesome. So who else would they hook up with? 
They're both on the same level. It's Jon Snow and and Daenerys Targaryen. It's it's let's face it, Superman should not be interested in Lois Lane. Superman is interested in Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is really kind of the only woman capable of being awesome enough for Superman. And likewise, and much more important, Superman is really the only person cool enough for Wonder Woman. Like, let's just face it. If one if Wonder Woman wants an equal, she's kind of a goddess. Who's the equivalent? Superman, a god. Like, Batman's nice, but come on, let's just be reasonable. Right? Ba- Batman is a, you know, come on. Ugh. So now, now what if you're her head maid? Who do you spend all of your time with? Solomon's noble butler. Like when they ho- when they're hanging out together, you and you, the two of you, are hanging shoulder to shoulder with each other, being like, oh, look at them make googly eyes. Oh, they're playing chess again. You know what that means. You know, oh. Just wait for the next flip Netflix episode where they do this in slow motion with the with the music in the background that's gonna tell you what's gonna happen. Like that's who like Salma's head chef hangs out with Sheba's head chef head chef. So what do you get? You get them talking, you get them interacting, you get them hooking up. Which is exactly like if you've ever done study abroad, this is the kind of thing that happens. Like people start they start breaking off into groups by their kind of levels, by things they have in common. And so they hook up and they have babies and we have this combination of cultures. And the Queen of Sheba gets pregnant and Salma is like, you are so awesome, Sheba. I will want to make you one of my many, many wives. And Sheba, who is a queen, by the way, is like, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> of course you're interested in making me a wife. But <gasps> woo, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, thanks, but I'm got to be going. And so she returns to Sheba with her retinue, those mixed race babies, Israel, Israelite merchants, because look, she's they're opening up a new trade route. So there are going to be Israelite merchants who are like, well, I'll go. I'll be at the start of this. Right? Yo, yo, brother, you stay here. I'll go to Sheba. I'll send you frankincense and myrrh from there. You'll sell it. You'll buy stuff. You'll send stuff to me. You'll send me like um, uh, Beirut cedar. You know, because the, in Yemen, there's bound not to be any trees. So you send it to me and we'll make a bundle. So there's scholars because now that they're hooking up in all this new culture, they're going to want to have new ideas or people to help them with the ideas. If they have questions, Sheba can't keep coming back to Solomon. So they need scholars who are going to come. So they're going to hire smart people. They're going to hire craftsmen. Oh, I really like the way you made this awning. Come here, hire. Mansa Musa will do the exact same thing as he go. And look, isn't this awesome? You're going to be hired by a queen. If I was, if I, well, this is why, you know, people of my professors of my level always kind of look at the jobs that open up in the Middle East at, you know, King Farouk University and like, huh. Why? Because I can't move up very high in America. I've got all those people with with Harvard degrees and Yale degrees, and they're, 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 there's not really a job market. So if you want to move, if you want to make a name for yourself, if you want to have a new experience, you go work for some other king because you'll be respected because you have a, you have a skill they don't have. And as long until they don't need you anymore, um, as a, but it's a way of moving, of jumping levels. You know, mercenaries do this all the time. So craftsmen, scholars, merchants, they all go. Thousands of people are going to go back. Thousands of Hebrews will go back. And what will they do when they get there? They'll hook up. 
They'll make babies. They'll get married. They'll have families. They'll get old. They'll die. They'll share their languages. They'll share their foods. But at this point, the Queen of Sheba drops out of history. Just as disaster begins to envelop Southwest Asia and Israel. The Kingdom of Israel. And they will be cut off. Until... But we not, you have to take a sidestep to a sidestep because you got to explain something. Because we have to explain the African version of this story. So in the Ethiopian epic, the Kibra Nagast, Solomon actually tricks her into sex. There's a like, you can't use anything in my realm. She drinks water. And he's like, ha ha ha, got to have sex with me now. And she's like, oh, you got me. And it's like, come on, really? Like, Solomon would be a pretty crappy host if he's not going to give a queen freaking water in the middle of a desert. I mean, come on. But what does that emphasis, what does that kind of story that Solomon tricks her into sex? It tells you about female purity. It tells you how important it is that she's not the sexual aggressor. That being an unmarried woman on, on roaming the world, that she's still pure she's still good so look you know here's a woman who is in charge and here in the stories that are written two thousand years later they got to deal with this kind of it's not misogynist but it's kind of it's um patriarchal the patriarchy is like well she's still a good girl it's like come on she's a queen she has what she wants if she wants water she has water what is solomon going to do about that but they needed an excuse now, here's where things get even crazier. So she has a son who becomes the king of the Ethiopian dynasty that will last until 1974. It claims descent all the way to Menelik, the son. Now, the Ethiopian dynasty actually can only claim as far back as like 1270, but still, that's 700 years of one family in charge. Not bad. Like, the Windsors are going on 150 years in England. Like, the Swedes go through one, two, like three families within 100 years in the 17th century. Like, right? Uh, the Old Kingdom had... Three families, three dynasties. So that one family lasts 700 years. Pretty good in Ethiopia. Very stable. Not bad. Plus, so not only do, does the Queen of Sheba's son establish traditionally as a story the dynasty of the Ethiopian kings, but he goes back to see Solomon. And as a kind of response... To Solomon tricking his mom, he tricks Solomon and ends up leaving with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the other there's other stories that are like Solomon knows that disaster is going to come after he dies, and so gives the Ark of the Covenant to him, to Menelik, knowing he'll take it back and keep it in, um, keep it safe from the disasters that are going to come. You know, Solomon looks at his other children and goes, Oh, these guys are not gonna do well. Well, Menelik, you're awesome. Here, take the Ark. So, one way or the other, there is a tradition that the Ark of the Covenant is actually in Africa. Whether as a trick against Solomon or as a protection uh, against the future destruction of the temple, it's the idea that it is safely taken back to Africa. Which is important because the way you know the Ark of the Covenant is probably because Indiana Jones comes along, a white dude, a white European dude, a white American European dude, comes along and makes a whole movie about the Ark of the Covenant being in Egypt where it was never in. There is no story and no history of the Ark of the Covenant ever being in Egypt. In fact, what it does is take the acts that happened in the New Kingdom and put them in Solomon's time, after Solomon's time. So, like having the pyramids being built during Ramses' time, which is 2,000 years earlier, 
or Ramses' time is 2,000 years later, what it does is it takes events from 500 years in the future and puts them back in the new kingdom to make them Egyptian. And it's, is it racist? Maybe. I don't know. But it's not culturally sensitive. It just picks it up from Africa, plops it in Egypt and says, the audience won't care. And the audience didn't care. Indiana Jones is an awesome movie. It's so awesome that you may not have never have noticed that Indiana Jones actually has nothing to do with the plot. That entire movie can happen without Indiana Jones. Like, think about that for a second. And I know this is an aside of an aside of an aside, but have you ever thought about Indiana Jones? He doesn't actually do anything that affects the plot of the story. It's kind of crazy. But it's an awesome movie. But it's wrong by any story. There is no story of the Ark being in Egypt. The Ark is in Africa. Or, more likely, it's kidnapped, it's taken by Nebuchadnezzar when he destroys the the temple. But likely, the Ark is taken, but the stones of the commandments and the law would have been buried somewhere. And that's another tradition. But we'll get there. All right, so... Oh, we have to go back. So the Queen of Sheba drops out of history until the 1970s, when there is a civil war in Ethiopia, and suddenly African Jews arrive in Israel hoping for citizenship. And there's like a, wait a minute, where are you coming from? Uh, you're not Jews? And they're like, uh, have you taken a look at us? We are totally Jewish. And they're like, wait, 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 we have white European Jews, and we have brown Middle Eastern Jews. We don't have black African Jews. And they're like, did you read your story about the Queen of Sheba? And they're like, oh yeah, it's a nice story, but it's not history. And they're like, well, it turns out it's a little more than just a story. And so this nice story that was supposed to be about how awesome Solomon is. Solomon is so awesome. Hot, super hot queens from the edge of the world are coming to see him. Suddenly became quote unquote history with real-world ramifications. Judaism had to change to reflect this new reality. And here's the irony. African Jews being cut off from the changes in Judaism in Europe, and to a lesser extent in Judaism, the changes in Judaism in the Middle East, actually in some ways had a more originalist notion because they kept tighter to the one tradition they had. They didn't have all of the future philosophers, all of the future. They don't have the diaspora, the destruction of the second temple by the Romans and the the diaspora across the Roman empire. They don't have the pogroms in Russia or in Germany. They don't have the Holocaust. Now they have their own oppressions being a minority in a Christian and a Muslim dominated part of the world. But at the same time, because of that, because they didn't have those other traumas, because they didn't have access to a, the world's Judaism, their only choice was to stay as close to the traditions as possible. So in some ways they were more original than the modern reformist European American Jews, which is kind of like, Here's a piece of the ancient world smacking the modern world. I mean, like, we're still here, which is kind of crazy and awesome at the same time and tells you the world is way more complicated than racist would ever think. Then then people would have you believe. So. What about trauma, disaster and trauma? So that was a nice aside. And it's a nice story. And the Queen of Sheba is awesome. And black women are awesome because they are awesome queens. And that's a nice story to deal with. Of cultural transmission. Of hooking up. Of making babies. Of new cultures. Of trying to get rich. And starting something new in the far place of right on, on the world. Of cultural transmission. Because what comes next is disaster. Is trauma. Is depression. After Solomon dies around 930, his kingdom splits up 
it breaks into two. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Now, Israel is richer. It's more urbanized. It's more populous. It's more sophisticated. It's more Mesopotamian. It's more tied into the global trade networks, especially to Phoenicia. Phoenicia is right on its border. It's right on its coast. Israel is the cool cousin. Do any of you have cousins that like you're the cool one or you're the not cool one and they're the cool one? There used there was a movie back in the day called The Hottie and the Naughty. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Um, it has Paris Hilton in it as the hottie, I guess. And, um, you know, that's the idea. There's There's a hot one and a not hot one. Well, Israel is definitely the hot one. In every way, it's the better place. You want to live there. It's more sophisticated. It's cooler. It's 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 New York City. Judah is in the south. It's more rural. It's less populated. It's less sophisticated. It's poorer. It's more traditional. But it has Jerusalem, which makes it also more religious. And this is fine. And they have their disagreements and they don't get along all the time. But it's fine. As long as neither state ever gets into anyone else's wars. And guess what happens? In 725, Israel joins Babylon in a war against Assyria. The Assyrians are starting to, to make some noise. They're starting to march up and down the Tigris. And the Babylonians are like, enough of this. I'm going to throw a party. I'm going to throw a party. I'm going to invite the world to it because I'm Babylon and I can do what I want. And so they call up Israel and they're like, yo, Izzy, Izzy, you want to come to a party where we beat the crap out of the Assyrians? It's going to be fun. It's going to be the best kegger of this millennium. And Izzy is like, yeah, cool. We'll do that. It'll be fun. Now, Judea is in the south and like, well, what Izzy does is like, well, hey, Babs, I got to tell you, I got to ask, is it okay if I invite my cousin? And Babs is like, Judy? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Mom, mom says, I should try to take my cousin to more places. And this sounds like it's going to be a fun time. And Babs is like, yeah, man, look, Izzy, we got to have you at this party. It wouldn't be a butt kicking without you. So if, if you got to ask Judy, your cousin, to come, that's cool. We're cool. Let, let us know what's going on. So Israel calls up Judah and says, yo, Judy. The coolest kids in Mesopotamia are throwing a party. Everybody's going to be there. Do you want to go? I don't know. That sounds like I'd have to go get. So I might get sand in my hair. Well, yeah. Well, when were you thinking? Well, probably like in two weeks, like two, next Saturday. Well, I was planning on uh, writing Yelp reviews of restaurants I haven't been to. Oh. Like this one place I wrote and I went, they have really hot buns. <laughs> oh, 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 Judy. Um, yeah, that's great, Judy. Uh, Izzy. Yeah, Judy. Um, gotta ask a question. Are you fooling around with those Babylonian gods? Hey, Judy, we talked about this. What happens in seven minutes in the Mesopotamian heaven closet? stays in the Mesopotamian heaven closet. Well, you know, I'm just saying we got a jealous God and, you know, you're f messing around. You're kind of polycurious. It's, it's not, I'm not judging, but, you know, there's kind of rules against this. And Hey, Judy, I'm my own nation now. We had this conversation. Look, all gods are the same in the dark. It's not like I'm married. I didn't know. No, no. I am i don't have a ring on this finger. I'm a free agent now. Look, we have an understanding. Just so you know, we're just trying things out. We're experimenting. I did this. Hey, we're, I'm a young nation. 
in a cool place in the world, trying things out. Shouldn't I have fun? Why are you such a killjoy, Judy? Well, you know, I just, just don't want you to get hurt. I worry about you. Well, thank you, Judy. But I'm going to go to this party. And I'm going to have fun. I'm going to kill some Assyrians. And it's going to be awesome. And then we're going to get drunk. And then we're going to play and have sacrifices to Babylonian gods. And it's going to be fun. Everyone's going to be drinking and carousing. And, you know, maybe we'll jump off the Tower of Babel into a swimming pool. It'll be great. So if you got to write your Yelp reviews about hot buns, and that's what makes you happy, you go right ahead. Okay. Well, I'll be thinking about you. Good luck. And what happens? Israel joins that army, marches north. They have the party. And the Assyrians are like freaking Neo in the Matrix. Comes out. Wah! Smashes these guys. Crux, crux the, the, the chariots of the Babylons. Goes charging right through Phoenician ships. Go, just obliterates things. Right? Like Miyagi in Karate Kid. Or the mouse rat mentor in in uh, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Wah! And this crushes everybody. And then the Assyrians go looking for retribution. You? You thought you would beat me? Me, with the greatest army in the whole wide world, and they march on Babylon and burn it to the freaking ground. And they march on Israel and they obliterate it. They commit a genocide. And this is the 10 lost tribes of Israel. The Syrians roll into Israel and obliterate the cities, kill the people, pick whoever's left up and depopulate them, spread them out. They do what the Romans do. They depopulate Israel. Israel before around 725 is a vibrant, you can see it in the, in the archaeology, it is a vibrant Hebrew culture. Lots of stuff. Lots of garbage. Lots of pottery. Lots of art. Afterwards, it's like the moon. There's nothing. It just stops for a while until the Assyrians actually move new peoples in. They pick the people up and they scatter them and they're gone. They are gone from history. This is about 85% of the Hebrews. This is a level of genocide that Nazis could not have dreamed of. What the Assyrians did, the Nazis couldn't have even dreamed of coming close to accomplishing. And this is a trauma to Judah. They watch their older, cooler cousin get obliterated. How could Yahweh do this? How could Yahweh allow this to happen? And in fact, Sennacherib comes rolling in at seven in 707 BCE, comes rolling into to Jerusalem, sits down outside and goes, you want some of this? No. Are you sure? Because if you come out and fight me, I'll destroy you. I know. So you're not going to fight me? I'm bad. I'm the Assyrians. I'm Sennacherib. No, no I know. You're tough. I saw what you did. I don't want a piece of that. Ooh, I'm cool with that. Hey, 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 hey. Were you at that party? Did you jump me? No. Are you sure? No. Yes. Because you kind of sound familiar. Are you like one of those kind of monotheist no well, yes i am but that was my cousin that was there you already took care of that uh we didn't go no i don't like parties all right so i'm gonna leave and you're gonna pay me a whole lot of money and i'm gonna insult you and your god to do it okay you're you're cool with that you're you most people get angry and then they try to fight us no you can true you could do that that's fine We'll pay. You're going to pay every year. I, I assumed. Thanks. Yeah, but we're cool. No problems. Good luck. All right, we're on our way to fight Egypt. Well, yeah. Um, yeah. 
Are you going to revolt in the back? And then I'm going to have to come back and destroy. No, no, no. No, I'm going to make Yelp reviews. I don't even know what a Yelp is. Well, it's a place where you write reviews of places that you don't go. And you talk about buns. You are a strange kingdom. Yeah, I get that a lot. All right. Well, if you're not going to fight me, I'm going to leave. You're going to pay me and I'm going to leave. And you're just going to be like this. Yep. Uh Uh-huh. And that's so in 707, Sennacherib came within an ace of actually obliterating the Hebrew people, all of them. We would have no monotheism. We'd have no Christianity. We'd have no Islam if Sennacherib had sacked Jerusalem. If if Judah had been part of that war, if it had joined its cousin, there would be none of this. There'd be no monotheism. Or at least the monotheism we know. That's how close the Hebrews came to actual extinction. Which is not a surprise. Why? Because the Assyrians obliterated lots of other people who you don't know the name of and I can't list. They're gone. They've been assimilated. So how does this genocide work? How does this assimilation work? Because I'll take the moment to talk about it because this is exactly what the Romans did to people. They did it to the Carthaginians. They did it to the Cistercians. And they're going to try to do it to the Hebrew, to the Jews. By that point, to the Jews. So what it is, is you pick people up and you scatter them. So one way a culture stays strong is everybody is together and they all live the same way. Well, if you scatter them, then they're separate. And so you move one or two Hebrews into a small town. Well, people are people. So what do they want to do? They're going to want to get married. So who are they going to marry? They can't marry a fellow Hebrew. There's none around. So who do they marry? They marry a local girl. They marry an Assyrian girl. And they have babies. And those babies are half Assyrian and half Hebrew. Now you, the Hebrew, can be keeping all the holidays, keeping all the rules. You could even be keeping kosher. Your Assyrian wife ain't. You know, maybe she doesn't throw it in your face or anything. But, you know, at the same time, she's still a Syrian and you're going to have to give way on things. But your kids want to be cool. And so who do they want to be? Their dad of a defeated people from a place they've never heard of or their mom who's awesome and cool and whose culture has conquered the world? Well, the answer is fairly obvious. They're going to want to act Assyrian. They're going to go to an Assyrian school. They're going to speak Assyrian. You know this if you're an American. You have seen this happen in your own family. So they're going to speak Assyrian. And then they're going to get married. And who are they going to get married to? They're going to get married to an Assyrian. They're going to marry marry an Assyrian girl. And then they're going to have kids. And those kids are now 1 25th, 1 1 4th, 1 4th, 1 half, 1 4th, 1 4th. But they're going to want to hang out with Assyrians. And then the next generation is one-eighth. And you can see how this happens. And so you go from being Hebrew, living with other Hebrews, doing Hebrew things, going to the temple, celebrating Hebrew holidays, to being the weird guy who does the weird things on the weird days in September. And your grandkids are like, to their friends, your friend, their friends are like, dude, what's your granddad doing? And they're like, I don't know. It's kind of weird. It's a thing he did when he was a kid, you know? So we just let him do it. It makes him feel good. But like, what happens to the culture? What happens to the law? What happens to the words? What happens to the stories? They disappear. They die out. Because the people that are getting married into don't want to hear it. My grandfather was Italian, born in Italy, moved here when he was seven by himself, came to America at seven by himself. Can you imagine such a thing? My father could speak some Italian, could understand Italian, not as well as his father. And I never heard the two converse in Italian, but apparently they used to do that sometimes. Me? Can't speak a word of Italian other than ciao. My kids won't speak any Italian. Though I can remember Italian kind of holidays. My kids, eh, 
we became more American as time went along. If I go to Italy, when I go to Italy now, no one says, oh, you're Italian. They go, hey, you're American. Was it a weird Italian name? I like it. I kind of like it. And I'm like, yeah, that's the closest I get. This is how cultures disappear. You don't have to murder all the people. You just have to have them stop acting the way they used to act. And this, this act, this act of culture is the most important resistance within Judaism. It's the resistance that will lead to pogroms. It's a resistance that leads to the Holocaust. It's the, it's Martin Luther going, why can't you just be Christians? And they're like, uh, Jews, the Jews of Germany are just like, because then we're gone. It's Native Americans not being able to leave the reservation because if they leave the reservation and get married to an American girl, their kids will become American and their culture will die. The Jews of the Middle, Middle Ages couldn't become Christian. If they became Christian, they stopped being who they were and they would lose all of that. And so then the tortures and the pogroms and the violence would happen. So, and it all kind of starts here. So Judah is traumatized. So what is the reaction? How could Yahweh do this to us? Well, the prophets and the Judeans come up with the answer that Israel wasn't Hebrew enough. You kind of heard it in my, in my little play. And it's slut-shaming. They slut-shamed Israel. Israel deserved it. You saw my little quote earlier from Jeremiah in the other video. You turned away from me, and I'm going to do bad things to you, said, thus saith the Lord. Israel wasn't Hebrew enough. They hung out with Babylonian gods. They hung out with Babylonians in Babylon. They liked to fool around with kind of polytheism. Hey, you know... We're just experimenting. We're trying things out. We're not tied down. Judea, the prophets, who are far more conservative, say they deserved it. They got what's coming to them. And so the answer is religious conservatism in Judah in the form of the literal view of the law. We are going to be super Hebrews. We are going to follow the law right now down to the letter if it says go to bed at 803 we are going to bed at 803 we're not going to bed at 955 no 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 that would be breaking the law but we're not going to bed at 726 either why because that would say i'm better than the law i'm holier than thou i'm more more yahweh than yahweh well you don't do that either And so the idea is we will be super Hebrews and the prophets begin to win. The prophets who come in with monotheism and like, look at what happened to Israel. They didn't, they fooled around with too many other gods. They weren't monotheistic enough. We have to be more monotheist. So monotheism wins. Yes, it's a reaction to trauma. Conservatism wins. We never change. We don't mix. We stay out of other people's politics. The Judeans aren't going to revolt against the Assyrians. Not a chance. And so you get a very insular, turned inward, conservative state within these giant, within the Assyrian Empire, which is not a bad thing to be because you don't want the Assyrians ever to be mad at you. And so nothing bad should ever happen again. Judah should exist as a small conservative state within larger empires. Even if the Assyrians go, the Judeans could just be this, could be this little um, uh, seed with a nice shell that's like, just leave us alone and we won't mess with you. And most empires are like, just give us some money and we go away. And Judea is perfectly fine with that because it allows them to keep their culture. So the idea is they should survive as a small conservative state within larger empires and thrive by keeping to itself and not changing. 
The problem is, is the world was changing around them. The Assyrians will be destroyed. The Medes and the Persians will show up. A new, stronger Babylon will try to conquer the world under a new king called Nebuchadnezzar, and he will have a fight with Egypt. Which means Nebuchadnezzar will roll into Jerusalem. And in 585 BC, Babylon destroys Jerusalem during a war with Egypt. They cart off thousands into slavery in Babylon, obliterate the temple, which is God's house. That's why you destroyed the temple. It's their biggest thing. It's to show you're defeated and it's to show your God is powerless. Right? The Assyrians will do it to the Babylonians. The Babylonians will do it to the Hebrews. They take the wealth. They disperse the knowledge. The Babylonians rip the culture up by its roots. This is the closest. This is the closest the Hebrews will come. Other than 707. This is even closer to genocide. To disappearing in the world. Because they're being carted off to slavery in Babylon. And so this is a trauma. So again, Judea is traumatized again, first by by events they witnessed and then by events that's happening to them. How could this happen? We followed the rules and Yahweh didn't protect us or worse, couldn't protect us. And so lots of people start going, F this man, I'm done. I'm done. I follow the rules, man. Yahweh's too weak. If Yahweh can't prevent his own temple from being burned, dude, what are we doing? Come on. And so lots of people assimilate and become Babylonian. But there is a core. But, 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 but there is the group that says, wait, I, it, that can't be the answer. We are Yahweh's chosen people. And Yahweh is the one true super God. And, and we were following the rules. And the answer they will come up with is, this is a test of faith. All those people who left, they didn't trust the plan. They didn't have diamond hands. They didn't have faith. They liked Yahweh when things were good. But you know what real love is? What real faith is? Loving someone when they give you the re every reason not to love them. When they hurt you. And so the idea is only true believers get to really be Yahweh's chosen people. We don't want bandwagon jumpers. We don't want pretenders. We don't want hangers on. We only want people who really believe in Yahweh. And if Yahweh is going to be good to us, Yahweh only wants people who really believe in him, her, them. Weak faith is no faith. You hold the line, trust the process, believe in what you cannot see. If you recognize the last one, it's because that's St. Thomas. Jesus comes to St. Thomas in the resurrection because St. Thomas, the doubter, right? St. Thomas represents Aristotelian thought in the argument. And he's like, everyone's like, Thomas, Jesus is back. The Lord is back. And he's like, I'll believe it when I can put my fingers in his holes and the holes in his hands. I'll believe it when I can see it. Because that's Aristotelian of observation. I believe in what I can see. And Jesus shows up. And says, Thomas, put your finger right there. Right there. And he's like, oh man. He's like, put it right there. Yeah. Am I here? Yeah. Yeah, Lord, you're here. Yeah. Well, blessed are those who believe but do not see. And in though that one phrase, Jesus kind of pooped on it science for about a thousand years. Science just died right there. Because it's about faith. It's about believing in things that you can't see. I can't see heaven, so I. but I have to believe in it. I haven't met Jehovah, but I have to believe in him, her, them. 
That's faith, belief, trust. Even if your senses say you shouldn't or don't have to. This is actually called Pascal's wager. And so for a small core group, maybe 25% of the original Hebrews, maybe, I, there's no way of knowing because they didn't take censuses, but it's maybe 25% of all the people that are left from, from, from Solomon's time. You've got this small core group that will be the seed for everything that comes after. But that group says, no, we are Yahweh's chosen people. And is their faith rewarded? Do they pass the test? The answer is yes, they do. When Cyrus shows up, Cyrus shows up, conquers Babylon, calls the people together, all the different peoples and says, who are you? And they're like, we're the Hebrews from Judea. Oh, so you're Judeans. Is, which is where the name Jews will come from. And they're like, yeah, we really are Judeans. Why? Because there's other people living, right? Remember, the Assyrians moved other people into their territory. The Babylonians did the same. So by call, by Cyrus calling them Judeans, it's like, haha, see that territory called Judah? That's ours. We get it back. And he's like, yeah, you get it back because I am Cyrus and I'm sending you back. And I'm going to help you rebuild the temple. And I'm going to help you regain your glory. And all these people come out and go, hey, hey, we were Hebrews too. And he looks at them and says, why are you saying that to me in Babylonian? Why are you dressed like a Babylonian? Are you eating pork chops? Well, yeah, because it's tasty. I once was a Hebrew. Well, actually, my dad was. Hey, come on. Can I go back? No, you got conquered. You're a Babylonian. The Babylonian converts don't get to go back. They don't get rewarded. So they pass the test. What is the important part of this? What did the culture learn? The culture learned to stay true to Yahweh even in the worst of times. And this, this is what changes the Hebrews into Jews. This concept. Because it will give us the rabbi. It will give us the um, small groups that you only need 10 people to have a religious ceremony. It is, it is, it gives us the Bible. It gives us the written down word because in the Babylon captivity is the attempt to hold on to the culture and passing it, passing that test and being returned allows the culture to survive and to thrive. And by passing that test, by being rewarded, you gain legitimacy and survival. And that will allow Jews to survive when terrible things happen. The Roman destruction of Palestine. The diaspora that will last for 2,000 years. The pogroms. The Holocaust. T event after event after event. Horrible event after horrible event. Most cultures would have disappeared. This one doesn't. Because they had proof that faith, even if it's a long time, it was a hundred years, gets rewarded. And so the civilization survives when others don't because tied to culture rather than to a place. Hebrew culture is flexible in belief and is incorporated trauma into its survival. Thank you. Be safe. Take care. I'm sorry that these stories are so terrible. We talk about genocide and war and murder and the destruction of peoples and the ends of cultures. But that's what happened. And that's that trauma is within these cultures that we talk about even today. This ancestral trauma. Because these civilizations that survive have to adapt through that trauma. And we see in these modern adaptions, adaptions to ancient hurt. So thank you for listening. 
Thank you for sticking with me. I know this is a long episode. This is the last episode of part three. Congratulations. You made the first five weeks. You made the first third of the class. 33% of the class is done. Congratulations. Be safe. Take care. Stay healthy. Thank you.